Father, we come before you recognizing that you, through your Holy Spirit, change our lives. So help us to surrender in this place today. Help us to give it up and over to you, Father, for those lost boys that are in this place, whether they're five years old or 95 years old. God, speak to their hearts. Let them know that there's hope and redemption in your son, Jesus Christ, in this place today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Glad that I have the opportunity to share. Pastor Chad has been traveling. He's at the, he was at the Southern Baptist Convention. Now he's actually traveling with his uh, family and seeing some sights in that area. We're going to continue on in our series called Impact. And when you think of the word impact, that's something that changes, hopefully, us or you. And so I have a question for you. When you think of the word, whether it's sports related or whatever, world champion. When I say the word world champion, what comes to mind? Muhammad Ali, I'm the greatest of all time. What else? Olympics, world champions. What else? I'm surprised nobody in here, and this is third service, nobody said the Lakers. You know, we live close to that. I mean, I'm not a Lakers fan, don't get me wrong. I'm a Celtics fan, but go ahead, you know, we're there. So, Lakers fans or the Kings. The Kings. Did they win the Stanley Cup? Go Kings. Look at there, and there's a New York Yankee fan cheering for the Kings. That's awesome, and, and I'm sure you said New York Yankees. Well, listen, I want to make a statement. I agree with you on those that all of those at some point in time have won what this world classifies as a world championship But I would like to be able to introduce you today to the undisputed champion of all creation, and his name is Jesus Christ. I thoroughly believe that Jesus truly is the undisputed champion of the world. And I believe that so much so that I'm not just going to stand here and say it and say, you got to believe it. I'm going to actually offer a compelling argument from God's word, and it comes from the book of Colossians. If you've got a Bible, take and turn to Colossians chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, there's some in the pews that are in front of you. It's on page 1253, I believe, if I can get my glass. Yep, 1251, and we're good. Starting in verse 15, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. Who, who is the he that he's referring to here? Jesus. Good. Y'all are so smart. Wow. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in all things hold together. He holds them together. He is the head of the body. The church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Verse 21, And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, Doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister or a servant. This is Paul writing to the church in the area, and he's talking to believers very similar to us. And I want to offer through this scripture a compelling argument that I believe there's four points, and I believe at the end of this, you too will agree that Jesus is the undisputed champion of all time. The first thing that we discover as we look at this is that Jesus is the image of of God. Verse 15 says, He is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You see, at Calvary, one of the essential doctrines that we hold true to is that there is one God, and that one God is revealed in three persons God the, God the, and God the. 
Did you notice I put a the between them and not a and? Sometimes we get caught up in Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit. It's God, monotheistic, one God, oneness of God. We believe that there is one God, and that one God is revealed in three persons. Next week, Chad's going to unpack that a little more for you. But as we start that process, I want us to realize that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, and Jesus is all God. God is revealed in three persons. God the God the and God the See, we don't have to be confused and we don't have to add the and to it. There's three different functions that it takes care of in our bodies and in our lives. And as we look at this package, we recognize that Jesus is God. We get a small glimpse of the image that we were made in. In the book of Genesis, God created man in His image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. Isn't that amazing? Not only is Jesus the image of God, we are the image of God as well. Now, this is what I want you to do. With your best, sincerest look and vocal, look to the person next to you and say this to them with all conviction. You were made in the image of God. What happened? Some of you are just now getting the what happened, aren't you? You know, last night they didn't even say it. They just started laughing. Because in all reality, we are made in the image of God. We were made in the image of perfection. What happened? What happened to us? It wasn't just Adam and Eve, but thank you. It was a three-letter word called sin Sin came into this world in destroyed distorted our entire view of the perfection of God. It gave us a glimpse of what we shouldn't be, and we, God, through us, has been trying from Genesis all the way through Revelation to reconcile our relationship with himself through the spoken, inspired word, letting us know, remember, you were made in the image of a holy God. We forget that sometimes, I truly believe. I truly believe when we look in the mirror, we don't see something that was made in the image of God. We were made in a perfect image, and then sin entered in this world to corrupt or distort our view of God. Sin separated us from God, and God's been trying to get us back ever since. So the first compelling argument is, according to this scripture, he, Jesus, was made in the image of God. And according to Genesis, we were made in the image of that God as well. Image of God. Jesus is made in the image of God. Second, as we continue to read in verse 16, Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the creator. Did you hear what it said in verse 16? All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in all things are held together by him. For by him all things were created. He is the entire creator of the universe. Jesus is the creator. Paul, in the book of Ephesians, talking to the church at Ephesus, reminded us in chapter 2, verse 10, that we are his workmanship. Mankind is his workmanship. Human beings are his workmanship. And we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Do you realize as the creation that God gave us, and us being made in his image, that we, human, mankind, is the crowning glory of what creation and what Jesus made? Now, he could have made the animals in his image, but he didn't. He could have made the earth in his image, but he didn't. Who did he make in his image? Us. Each one of us he made in his image. We are God's crowning glory, and he created us for fellowship with him. Sin entered and separated that fellowship. 
Jesus entered and bridged the gap to show us that we can have that fellowship with the Holy God. And as we walk, as everything was created by him and for him, how, then, are you treating this creation that God created? How are you treating, how are you treating this creation? Are you taking care of the things that are around you? Are you taking care of yourself? You know, one of the things that I think we forget is that if we were made in God's image, we were made for his pleasure and his purpose, we have a responsibility to take care of ourselves. Do you agree with that? How are we doing with that? I think some of us are doing a phenomenal job and some of us are struggling with it, right? I've got one more notch that I can move over. (laughs) That's going down, by the way. You're seeing a lot less of Chet. Why? Because I wanted to increase the possibility of me being around medically to see children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren graduate. So I had an opportunity to take what God created within me, this creation, this wonderfully made creation in his image, and change some of the things that I was doing to this creation. And so here's my challenge for us as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ. Take it very seriously that if we were made in the image of God, we cannot facilitate Life change if we're not here. Only our memory can. Now, some of you during this song, if you were listening to some of the songs, got to thinking about a father maybe that has gone. I lost my father 20 years ago. And that's the first time really that I'd really thought, well, wow, he's not here. But yet his memory stays alive. I was made in the image of my earthly father, but I was created in the image of my heavenly father. You see the difference? We are created in the image. So I think the second compelling argument is not only, not only is Jesus the image of God, but Jesus is the creator. So if he's the creator, let's choose to walk in the path of appreciation of what God gave us, not on the path of depreciation. Let's continue to love and embrace one another. In John chapter 13, Jesus gave his intimate, most intimate friends a a new commandment. Now think about this. Here was God. He was the creator of the universe, and he said, I'm going to give you something new. Well, you knew it had to be good, right? And he said, this command I give to you that you do what? Love one another. And then he said the reason why he gave that commandment. Why did he give that commandment? He followed it up by this All men will know that you are my disciple if you have what? Love one for another. You see, that's what separates us from the rest of the world. If we have love one for another, they're going to look. And they're going to notice there's something a little bit different. It's not just about me first. It's about sharing the love. Displaying the image of the creator of the universe in our lives. And we get the privilege to do that every single day with every conversation we have in every single instance in our lives. So let's love and embrace one another. Let's love the Lord our God. And let's love our neighbors as ourselves. The third compelling point that I'd like to make is the fact that in this scripture, in verse 18... Jesus is declared as the head of the church. Actually, he's the head of the body is what it reads. Starting in verse 20, in you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. For in him all of the fullness, he, in, in, in verse 18, is the head of the body. And then he declares, as he is the head of the body, he declares what the head of the body is. It's the church. Do you find it interesting that Paul uses the body analogy here and appoints and points out that Jesus is the head? Can you do a whole lot with your body if you don't have your head attached to it? You really can't, can you? Now, I'm not saying that to be morbid, but I'm just saying if you were separated from your head, the body is lifeless. 
enter into a lifeless body because of sin, we are redeemed, we are forgiven, we are put back the way it originally was designed by allowing Jesus to be the head of the body. And it says the head of the body, the church. Now, who is the church? Every one of you, raise your hand. We are the church. I am the church. You are the church. It's not bricks and mortar. It's us as individuals. It's us as the creation that was made in the image of a holy God. He made us to be able to follow the head. Did you also notice in that that he holds all things together? Back up in verse 16. And he is before all things and in him all things are held together. Jesus Christ is the super glue of all creation. He holds things together. Now, when I use the analogy of super glue, you, you do know what I'm talking about, right? Any of you had one of those neat experiences with super glue when you got a little too much on it and got your fingers stuck together? You know, and you were trying to put the cap on and the cap wouldn't go on because your fingers couldn't separate and the glue stuck? Think about this. The same way that that glue holds us together here on this earth, that simple analogy, the Holy Spirit of God, who is God, holds us together as we follow the head. We're the body held together, all creation held together by that super glue, and the super glue is the creator, and that's Jesus. And we get the privilege of following that creator. Is that fun or what? That's what we were created for, to follow the head. Now, God entrusts us with people to lead to life-changing relationship. You heard the OC say it. Our mission is Calvary Baptist Church is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. His truth that we're referring to is God's word. The love that we're talking about is the same love that Jesus challenged us to have so that the entire world will know that we're his disciples because we have love one for another. Now, we're part of a denomination. And I know that there's a friend of mine that's sitting to my right. I'm not going to call him out, Gary, that doesn't care for, care for denominations. Matter of fact, made a bold statement. Want no part of denominations. And understand that. And, and here's some shocking news for some of you. If you've never been through Intro to Calvary, hold on to the pew. We are a Southern Baptist church. I know, what? Yeah, thanks, Tom. What? I know that some of you, that shocks. But here is the cool thing about being part of the Southern Baptist Convention. We get to to help fund about 10,000 missionaries and about six different seminaries, but they absolutely, 100%, cannot tell us what we can do in our worship services. They cannot enter into these halls or these walls and say, you got to do this or you got to do that. Who does that for us? Jesus does that for us. And there is a head at this church, and he follows the head of the body. The head of this church is Pastor Chad Garrison. And he gets his marching orders directly from the head of the body that transposes it to us and we share it with you and you share it with everyone that's there. That's what helps this ministry function because we're choosing to follow the order that God created. Why? Because we were made in the image of an invisible God. We, each of us, were made in that image. We were created in that image as well. And we are choosing to follow the head of the church, which is the body. But here's the cool thing. No matter what the denomination says, no matter what the newspaper says, whether it's an orchid or an onion, no matter what, <laughs> no matter what Pastor Chad, Pastor Chad, or Pastor Chad, or any of the ministry leaders say, God's holy word, anointed with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God trumps anything we will say if it's contradictory to what we say. God's holy word wins. 
It trumps. It wins every time. Why? Because we're going to choose to follow the creator of the universe that was made in the image of the invisible God, and his name is Jesus. He is the head of this body. And now the coolest part for us, you remember we were made in this image, and that three-letter word called separated us? Jesus Christ came into this world to become, my fourth argument, a peacemaker. This world became, became filled with chaos when we sinned, and Jesus willingly, by the blood of his cross for all humanity, reconciled us to God. And as we re- read previously in verse 21, we are once as a result of sin. What did it say? Alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Now, most of us don't think that the sin that we do is an evil deed. But is there such thing as a little sin or a big sin? A sin separates us from God. It alienates us. It's an evil deed. And the word calls it out. And Jesus, he, the he here, has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death and resurrection in order to present you what? Holy and blameless. The Greek translation of the word reconcile, as we look at that or becoming in that area, is the word change or exchange. So here is the fabulous thing that Jesus did for us. Jesus, after asking Father three different times, if you go back and read the account, Jesus was traveling and and he went to pray three different times. Daddy, can we do this differently? And Daddy said, no. Daddy, can we do this differently? No. Dad, are you sure we can't do this differently? No. Okay. I'll be willing to reconcile the entire creation, everything past, present, and future to you, Daddy, so that by my shed blood, the acceptable sacrifice, I can take all of humanity who chooses to accept Jesus and present them holy and blameless before you, Daddy. Will that work? Absolutely. What a great Father's Day. Amen. That we look and we understand that the cross, that the blood that was shed on the cross was the acceptable sacrifice that reconciled all of us that are in this room for a main purpose, and that is for us to bring glory to God and that Jesus can present us as holy and blameless. Why? He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. You are not accused guilty. Here is one thing that's coming to mind for me. Each time we do a baptism, that's a recreation of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that? That's the next step in our journey. And when I say the next step in our journey, the first step is confessing with our mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. And believing in our heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, we can secure that salvation that comes only through Jesus. And that next step in that journey is baptism. We believe in baptism by immersion because the word immersion means under, down, and we celebrate that. Here's what I'm finding out. If you symbolically imagine going in that water and that being a grave, you're not Jesus, and so you don't raise from that grave, do you? The dead man, the sinful man, the sinful person is buried in that water. Don't reach and try to grab him and bring him out with you. That man stays in the grave. You are not held or bound by your past. That is settled by the blood of Jesus. You're proclaiming to the world that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Why? Because you chose to accept the fact that Jesus' blood was enough for you. That's my fourth compelling argument. Now, in closing, I'd like to say this as we look at it. We're in a battle. We're in a fight on a day-to-day basis. 
Some of us have to fight to get one leg out of the bed and put it on the ground. Maybe it's because of physical reasons. Maybe it's psychological reasons. I don't know. Some of us have to fight to speak to folks in a nice manner. Some of us are just in a battle all day long. Can I tell you, you're not in this battle by yourself? You see, in a heavyweight champion, somebody said something about Muhammad Ali. In that battle, when somebody went down in a boxing match, there's corners. And the person that gets knocked down is laid down, and they're making the count. And the opponent goes to a his corner or a neutral corner. He can't go to the opponent's corner. But here's a clue. I want to draw you in. I want to ask you this question. Thinking about a fight. Whose corner are you in? Are you in the for Jesus corner? Or are you in the against Jesus corner? Because in the reality of life, there is no neutral corner. In the battle that we're fighting, you're either for God or you're against God. There is no neutrality where that's concerned. My challenge is to choose this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, I will choose God. My compelling argument has been presented. We're made in the image of a holy God. Jesus Christ is the creator of this universe. He came to reconcile us to himself. He is the peacemaker. He is the creator. He is the image of God. He is the head of the church. In other words, Jesus is the undisputed champion of all creation. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, thank you that you give us an opportunity to present our argument to you and to this congregation. My prayer is, God, that you would continue to help us to serve, to love, to embrace, to encounter you in this place as we continue in our songs of worship. In Jesus' name, amen.